Glory be to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Life track. Life track. It's our process, it's our system for making disciples. So we're starting this six week series to, to bring everybody through, give us the ideas, the concept this morning. And we're trusting God to open our eyes. We've learned the last few, last month, that when God brings us into something new, He takes us and helps us to see it so that we can believe it and receive it and step out into it with confidence that it's His will and in His power by faith, in other words, trust in Him. And so, uh, life track, if you think we talked about the those five circles with Rick Warren's example. The outer circle, it looks like a bullseye. The outer circle is the community that we live in. You know, all the people around us. And then the next circle is the crowd. You know, as we come together in the name of the Lord and do things in his name, a crowd is drawn. You know, people see God at work. A crowd comes in, all sorts of people. And then the, the circle inside of that is the congregation. That's the folks like this morning. Not everybody here is a member of the church. People, some here this morning just checking things out. You may be here this morning. You've never even, never received Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life yet. You never come into a walk with God as your heavenly father. Father. And we're singing this morning about, I'm surrounded by the Father's arms, surrounded by songs of deliverance. And you haven't yet tasted the goodness of God in that way. Well, you can this morning. We trust that the service will be a step along that path and that you'll become a part of the congregation. We're glad that you're here and there's no strings on you. Just feel open to receive. And, and then the next circle in is the, is the, 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 the committed. That's the members of the church. Those that have said, this is not just, this is my church, this is us, and are part of that. And then the, the circle, the bullseye in the middle, that's the core of the church, that's the leaders of the church. Those are the ones that are here when it's 30 below and five inches of snow, and you know, those are the ones that are, that are saying, you know, we're, it's not just pointing the way, those are the ones that are saying, follow me, boys, follow me, girls, as I follow Christ, let's do this thing. This is what God wants us to, to do, and here we go. And so that's the leaders, praise God, and so the, the goal, of course, Jesus said make disciples is to help people move from those outer circles into the inner circle. And then you could put point right in the middle, really, if you wanted to, and say that's the commissioned. Those are the ones that have answered the call of God in whatever area of their life they're in to go out and take the name of Jesus to the world. And so all of us really are on course of that. And so what we want to talk about this morning, I'm going to tell you just a, a little bit. But first of all, uh, let me just say, share this with you, that I I grew up, I grew up uh, surrounded by a group of people that loved me. I was a part of, the, of a church as a, as a child, as a kid, and I didn't know all the people there real closely, but, but some of them were called friendly helpers. That was their Sunday school class names, the adults, Sunday school. Some of them were called faithful followers. They were my parents' Sunday school class. My parents got involved in that group, and the church that we were in, man, when you got involved in the Sunday school class, that was your group till you died, <laughs> you know? And, and matter of fact, as my parents got older, they watched the different members of the congregation go to be with Jesus. And, uh, but I remember as a kid being so loved by that group. And once a month, you know, they'd have Sunday school class meetings where we'd go to their house. And I remember being out at one house. I can see that house right now, you know, those kids are playing outside. See another house where we were there. I, I tell you, I felt so secure, so secure, so comfortable, you know, belonging. I felt like I belonged. I didn't have to prove anything, you know, and, and even today, and that, that group of people was, was around it, you know, when we did get born again, when I did get born again, because I didn't get saved till after I got married and, and become a Christian, even though I grew up in church, you know, growing up in church doesn't make you a believer, you know, any more than sleeping in a garage makes you a car. You know, if you're, born a, if you're born a mule, it takes a miracle to turn you into a thoroughbred. You, know, you train all day long, get as religious as you want, but you're not going to change unless there's a miracle. Well, when you accept Jesus, there's a miracle that happens. You know, I became a different person inside after we got married. And, but, you know, that, that group of people that, that I was surrounded with, that love, I just felt so secure, so comfortable. I belonged. You know, and I know even now, you know, even though I haven't been there but a couple times in 35 years, I know that if I was in trouble, I really needed something, I know I could call several of those people right now and they'd be there for me. 
You know, then there was another, uh, I remember years ago, or years later, after I actually became, I was pastoring, came on staff here. You know, the previous pastor was, was here, and uh, we were transitioning, and I was a member, before I came on staff here, I actually I, itinerated, was an itinerant minister, and traveled really all, over a large part of the country, building a network, a financial support network, for missionary work in the Philippines. And in the course of that, I traveled around Iowa. And I ministered in a lot of churches in Iowa, a lot of churches pastored by people, uh, by guys who were part of my ministerial association that had graduated from the same college that I'd graduated from. And they're brothers, you know, so I'd ministered in their churches and we had a relationship, you know, we were buds. And then I came on staff up here and it meant it was a little bit different. I was young, I was 30 years old, the previous pastor was well, he had dark hair, I had blonde hair. He, he'd been on his own since he was 16. He was from Texas, he had a really deep voice and a very powerful ministry and a very, frankly, I was intimidated. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, I'm young, and trying, you know, you've heard of fake it till you make it? <laughs> you know, I was just, you know, never let him see you sweat, but man, you know, underneath. <laughs> you know, so just a little nervous. And then one day, there was a, a meeting in another part of the state of the group that my ministerial association. So I asked the pastor to go with me. Well, we, we went together. And when we got there, you know, I didn't even think about it. I just walked in. I said, and when I saw who was there, the, hey, you know, I'm just going on, hugging them and shaking their hand. We're cutting up, telling stories. Just, it was great. I belonged. You know, it was just, and I didn't realize that, you know, how I was even behaving until I, you know, I went back to the table and I sat down with the pastor. And he just looked at me and said this, the righteous are bold as a lion. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just making his, you know, letting me know what he had observed. You know, and I hadn't really thought about it. But what he was seeing was I belonged. There was just something, you're with me so far? You know, and in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, there is, or verse 23, Acts chapter 4, verse 23, we'll, we'll read this verse. Let me give you the backstory. Peter and John had gone to the temple at, at, for, for worship, and there's a man sitting there who was lame, and he was begging, and he asked them for some money. And Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have, I'm giving to you. I give unto you. And he, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he reached down, took him by the hand, and lifting him up, the man was totally healed and went walking, leaping, and praising God. And everybody marveled. Well, not everybody marveled. The religious leaders really got hot about it because it challenged their position, challenged their behaviors. And they pulled Peter and John in and accused him and railed on him and commanded him not to preach or teach. In other words, don't do this anymore. Don't preach or teach in the name of Jesus. And of course, it's not, basically they said, you judge, is it right to obey you or to obey God? And there's no other name. You wonder how this guy got healed? It's by the name above every name. There's no other name among men given whereby someone might be saved. It's by the name of Jesus that this man is whole among you. And they threatened him and told him not to do it anymore. And in verse, and so they, they let him go, and we pick it up in Acts chapter four verse, 4, verse 23. It says, and being let go, they went to their own company. Can you all say their own company? They went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Listen, having your own company is good. It's good to have your own company. And I want to talk to you today about why belong. Hallelujah. Why belong. Now, let's add, someone might ask the question, well, are we, are, we, are we talking about church membership? Are we talking about groups? Are we talking about attendance? And my answer to that would be yes and. Because we're not, not simply registering on a form or, or having gone through steps or gone through a process or showing up. 
But what I'm talking to you about, what I want to talk to you about is engaging. Engaging. Think of it this way. You can meet, think of it this way. Think of meeting somebody online and you develop a relationship with them. And, and it can, it's a real relationship. Virtual, digital relationships, they're real relationships. And, and, but if you fall in love, you're ultimately going to want to meet and do life together. Listen, there's something, it's the same way with Jesus and people and the church. There's something about human relationships that requires presence. Yep. Come on. Now, look with me at Romans chapter 12. We'll look at verse five. Romans chapter 12, verse five. Paul uses the word, the Spirit of God uses the word membership. It's talking about membership. In Romans chapter 12, verse five, he says to believers, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. We're all members of one another. Say it with me. We're members of one another. Now, listen to what he doesn't say. Because right away we think, well, we're members of the church. We're members of the body of Christ. We're members of the family of God. But that's not what he says. He says we're members of one another. It's, see, it's real easy for us to think, okay, I'm a member of the church, or I'm a member of the, a group, or I, I'm a member of this, or I'm a member of that, or I'm a member of the body of Christ. But I want you to take that step with me. Take that step, because it is a step to, to realizing we are members of one another. Of one another. See, the metaphor is powerful, it's, and it's not just a metaphor. There's a reality to it. There is an indivisible unity. Christians, believers, we are members of one another. Just in the same way that an arm is a member of the body. And listen, an arm can't survive without being a part without being a part of the body. Think of the, think of the terms member. Just think about those words, member and body. We belong to one another in a very profound way. Belong to one another in a very profound way. Look at the old 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start with verse 12. We're going to read quite a bit of this, this chapter 12. And I'm going to read it today. We're going to read it out of the message paraphrase. Because it's funny. <laughs> because, it's, because it's live. It's accurate. It's accurate to the original. But it really brings it home in a great way. Membership. I'm talking to you today about why belong. Why belong? Because in the day in which we live... Things have changed. Back in the 60s, the, uh, after the post-World War II, when, the, when, when the, what was happening in society at that time, you know, Johnny came home from the war, people started having babies, population started booming, housing devel development started going up all over the place. There was a big societal change. And at that time, church membership was the primary way of social belonging. But that's not the case today. Things have changed. The generation that is alive today, they have, we have, I won't just say they, although it's true of the younger generation, but man, don't, let's quit dissing the millennials. You know, after all, they're not the youngest generation anymore. Sorry, millennials, but there's already <laughs> another group that's come along behind you. You're getting to be the old folks. <laughs> well, not really, but, but. Things have changed. There, there is a, for one thing, people move more. For another thing, technology has changed. 
And for another thing, there's a global connection that was not there before. I mean, how many of you remember those things that used to hold their hand? Anybody remember that princess thing with the curly cord on the bottom of it? Called a phone? <laughs> or how many, anybody, or let's go back a little bit older. Anybody remember the wooden ones that hung on the wall with the crank and under, you know, two longs and a short? Okay, that was, that, was the, that was the internet of earlier days. You know, if you, the Google of yesteryear. You know, if you, if you wanted to know what was going on in your community, you wouldn't do Google. You just pick up the phone and listen and listen into the gossip that was going on on the party line. My sister's gotten a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> because when you picked up the phone on the other end, it would click. And people would say, is there somebody listening? Well, if you are, you're not going to tell them. <laughs> you know, but things have changed. You know, and we have, where years ago, and and... Listen, uh, church attendance, church involvement, church commitment and engagement, you know, it's always, it's waxed and waned. Uh, but what happened in the 1800s, for instance, early 1800s, one in six people attended church regularly. But then came along Charles Finney and other great revivalists and preachers so, uh, preaching the fact, the truth that a relationship with God came by personal commitment to Christ and personal accountability and by the 1850s, one in three people were part of a church and engaged and involved, participating. And then, then came World War II and a, a big movement. But the, here's the challenge. A lot of people have made what they experienced in the 60s the norm, but it's not the norm. And, and because they hang on to that, and that expectation, even though it's been declining over the years, here's what I'm saying to you, is that the ways people connect have changed. And we as a church need to be willing to recognize that and adjust our method. Not change the message, it's still Jesus. But people connect differently. They connect all over the world. But those connections are loose connections. They're not tight connections. You know, here just this past week, you know, I was at my mother-in-law's house. She'd, she'd, been, she'd been taking care of, of my father-in-law, and he, uh, he went home to be with Jesus, and so she moved back home, hadn't been there for quite a while, and wanted to watch TV. So I saw that, and I thought, okay. So I called the satellite, satellite TV company, and, you know, the first thing they did, one the first, and I was on the phone a long time. Anybody ever done that? You know, so I was on the phone, but one of the first things they said was, check the connections, Check the connections. Are they tight? Well, nobody's messed with them, so, but, you know, we checked. You know, loose connections can be a problem. If it's electricity, some of you guys know electricity? Some of you people, you know electricity? You know that if it's a loose connection with electricity, you can get a little power going through, but also it builds up heat and can really make a problem if it's not tightened up. Or how about plumbing? You know, some of us, I, I've done some fix-up stuff and remodeling stuff. Personally, I think it's a, it's a miracle if it doesn't leak. You know, it's always a cause of rejoice. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. I remember fixing up the bathroom upstairs before I sold our house. And I'm sitting there on the tub, and we had changed the shower, so I've got all this copper laying out there. I've got, it, frankly, it looked like a stick man. Kind of like this with all the, the pipes and everything, little pieces and corners. I had it all laid out. And I had the goop on it, the flux on it, and was getting ready to solder it, and I would move, and it would move. And I'd get it straight back, and I would move, and it would move. And finally, it got to the point, I said, Lord, I could really use your help. And you know what? That thing just went together and did not leak. Yay. He has a pause for praise. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. But the point is, we need tight, tighter connections because we have these loose Connections. Now, listen. I know, I know that 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 people have mixed feelings, and I know that that people are wary and distrustful of institutions, and that that different generations, younger generations especially, are have a different uh, view and attitude about trusting institutions. But let me say, let me, hear me now. The church is not an institution. It's a family. We're a family. And we're not a business. 
we're a body. And, and we're not an organization. We're an organism. And sure, there's organization, but we're an organism. We're a living, breathing body of Christ. And, and so... Uh, I realize that people have mixed feelings, if you want to say it that way, approaching institutions, but at the same time, I want you to know that there's a lot to be gained from a deeper, tighter, more sustained commitment to the church. I want you to know that. I know. I want you to know that I know. I want you to know that I know the people are a little bit ambivalent about belonging. But I also want you to know that there's a lot to be gained yes. from a sustained, deeper commitment yes. to the church. Amen. And at the same time, I want to give you a no-strings-attached invitation. Because I know that people are checking out the things of God. I know that happened in my life. That, that there was, and I needed liberty to do that. And God gave me that liberty. Thank God he didn't quit on me. Didn't give up on me. Can I get an amen from a believer? Yes. Aren't you glad that the love of God kept coming after you? Yes. But, but at the same time, he doesn't usurp your authority and your place. And so the goal of this message today is that you will value belonging enough to commit yourself to Christ and the church family. Because we're a family. We've been welcomed into the family of God. Ephesians 2.19 in the Living, in Living Bible says, you are a member of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. You belong in God's household with every other Christian. In, in 1 Peter 3.8, it says that you should be one big happy family full of sympathy toward each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. One big happy family. Can you look at your neighbor and smile at him real big? And say, hello, cousin. <laughs> See, <laughs> God, <laughs> now that kissing cousin stuff in here. Huh? <laughs> this is, anyhow, God, God expects you to be a member of his family. And, and really, a Christian without a church family is an orphan. It's an orphan. Why don't you find one more neighbor and tell them, no more orphans. Now look at the 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll start reading with verse 12. You can easily see, easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. Oh man, that's countercultural. That wars against our American independence. Give me liberty or give me death. No, when you accepted Christ, you said goodbye to your partial and piecemeal independent life. Go on, let's read what it says. We each choose to live in, the, we, each, we each choose to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us now is a part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, black or white, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. And I can't read that, but I think about, and I know Bill Cosby has fallen into disfavor in these days. But as a kid, uh, someone gave us some Bill Cosby. I mean, he's a hilarious comedian. And he did a, a whatever he called a shtick or a set or a, a thing <laughs> uh, about the chicken heart that ate New York. And I'm telling you, as a kid, I'm listening there and he, and it gets louder, boom, 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 bo
boom, boom, boom. I mean, you just see, ah, it's this chicken heart going through and devouring New York City. I'm sorry, but I can't read this verse without thinking about the chicken heart to date New York. A body isn't just a part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If foot said, I'm not elegant like hand embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body. Would that make it so? What do you say, church? Oh, come on. What do you say, church? Do we need to read it again? Let's read it again. If foot said, I'm not elegant like hand, I'm not elegant like hand. Embellished with rings. I guess I don't belong to this body. Would that make it so? There you go. If ear said, I'm not beautiful like I, limpid and expressive. I don't deserve a place on the head. Would you want to remove it from the body? No. No. If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? And always add, the feet would smell. Small joke. As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. Thank God he did not put the nose next to the armpit. Okay, there's just some parts of the body that work very well when they don't have to work together. Let's read on. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it's only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand or a chicken heart wouldn't be a body but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine I telling hand, get lost, I don't need you. Or head telling foot, you're fired. Your job's been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic and therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body that you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is, without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? He goes on then. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts... Every other part is involved in the hurt. Now, if you don't know what that's like, let me just illustrate. I know what that's like, and I think most of you do too, if you've ever gotten out of bed at night without turning on the lights on, found the dresser with your little toe. I mean, right before Christmas, we bought a new coffee table. It's one of those industrial-looking things with the wheels that kind of pivot, kind of factory-looking like, with the little tabs that you can lock. And, you know, I don't know that you're ever going to move a slab of meat around with the coffee table, but, but it's there. And you know what I, I know? I, I know that, that, that those wheels were not designed for contact with your toes. But it, it seems like your toes find those wheels if you're within three feet of that coffee table. And it's just, oh, 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 darling, oh, darling, my little toe. I mean, what I'm saying is when one part's hurting, every part gets involved. Massaging that thing, you all right? Yeah. (laughs) Any other time you're ugly and we can keep a shoe on you, but but we care. (laughs) What's going on? If, if one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. Woo! Glory. Lost 20 pounds. New outfit. Looking good. Yeah. Yes. Come on. Why are you? Am I the only one? I'm not the only one. You're looking at me like a cow at a new gate. Like a dog at a new pan. You don't know if you want to eat out of that or not. Yeah, every part is involved in the exuberance when somebody has a win. Isn't that right? 
Then that's, that's church. Look at your neighbor and tell him that's church. He goes on and says, you, you know, the other day I watched a movie. It's an older movie called Co- Coach Carter. And he coaches a basketball team. His big point was, we're a team. One guy screws up, everybody runs. You know, one, one guy messes up, everybody does the push-ups. We're a team. We're a team. As I said, we're one body. Can you all say belonging? belonging? We're belonging. And it's not just attendance. It's not just signing up for something. It's not just your name on a paper. It's, it's I'm one with this. I'm one with you. I'm a part with you. You are Christ's body, he goes on to say. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in his church, which is his body. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, those who pray in tongues. But isn't it obvious by now? But it's obvious by now, isn't it? That Christ's church is a complete body and not a gigantic unidimensional part. It's not all apostle, not all prophet, not all miracle worker, not all healer, not all prayer in tongues, not all interpreter of tongues. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. But now I want to lay out a far better way for you. Listen, they were competing. They were focused, focusing on their gifts, on their personalities, on their place, on, on who they are, they, and focusing on transactions. You know, how, how they were interact, how what they were doing with somebody or to somebody and focusing on transactions and on their gifts and their personalities. But God says, I'm showing you a better way. It's relational. It's transformational, not transactional. It's love. And the whole next chapter, the whole 1 Corinthians 13, unpacks what love looks like. And then the first verse of the next chapter, chapter 14, says... Desire spiritual gifts, but learn to walk in love. Pursue love. Pursue love. Listen, only when your part is part of the whole does your part mean anything. Anybody, anybody here ever bought a bicycle in a box? You know, and on the side it says some assembly required. And so depending on your personality and how much of a rule keeper you are, you open the box and you lay it out and all the parts there and you read the instructions. Maybe you don't read the instructions. You got everything laying out there. You start to put the thing together. And over here are some nuts. And when you put the nuts, and some of those nuts, you put the wheel in the frame, you put the nuts on the nuts, hold on the axle and the nuts hold the wheel in the frame. Are you with me so far? So once it's assembled, those nuts are a part. But until it's assembled, it's just a nut. <laughs> Selah. Stop. You know, it's just, what did he say here? He said, only as you accept your part of the body does your part mean anything. Yeah. You know, until you're assembled, you finish it. You know. <laughs> 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 now, let's just quickly go through some things because I want to give you, you know, sometimes I grew up watching Johnny Carson sometimes and now, now the other fellows on The Tonight Show and David Letterman used to do this all the time, do the top 10. You know, ESPN does it, top plays of the week or the top goofs of the week. So I'm going to just give you 10 things very quickly about Belonging. And you can rank them if you want to. I'm just numbered them to number them. They're not in any particular order. First one, though, is that belonging, when we're talking about belonging, we're talking about warmth and connection with a lot of people that are not in a small group with you. Just like that whole church that I was talking about. Now, not all of them. We weren't close with all of them, but I can tell you that there were some, like I said, even today, I could call on them. And here's the point of why I'm telling you that about my church it, it, that I grew up in is I want that same experience for your children. That love, that comfort, that security, that belonging. I want that for your kids. 
and for you. Number two is safety. Safety. There's spiritual and emotional uh, support that you have, a commonality, a community, uh, a strength that we can draw from with each other. And say, do we really? And I had to ask myself, do we really live that way around here at Word of Life? Or is this just a pipe dream? We just blue sky in it? But the reality is we do live that way with those that are engaged. We really do. You know, I've learned a number of years ago that, that, to st- that God leaves our choice with us. You know, like one person came to a pastor and said, Pastor, fix my life. And the pastor said, I can't fix your life, only you can. And I learned that I, I had to draw boundaries. That God leaves our choices, our authority, our sovereignty personally with us. And that it's not mine to go chasing people down. Jesus didn't. You know, so to be healthy, I don't. But we do want you to engage. We are here for you. And I can tell you this, there's safety in it. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, that Satan, the devourer, the adversary of your soul, walks about seeking whom he might devour. And like the wild dogs of the Serengeti or the lions of the Maasai Mara, he devours those who are stragglers who are off by themselves, looking out there on their own, no longer a part of the herd, no longer part of the flock, but out insisting on doing their own thing. He's out there devouring them. But when you have your own company, when you have, when you have your own friends, when you have a group of people, when you have a group of people that love you, you have someone to go to, someone to pray with you. There's an account in where a man was sick, so sick he, was, he couldn't even... He was not mobile. And Jesus was in a house preaching and the power of God was present to heal those people there. So he had four friends, four of his friends, put him on a stretcher and carried him to the house. And when they got to the house, they couldn't get in because of the crowd. They went up on the roof, tore the roof open. It just happened to be Jesus' house, by the way. He didn't get torqued. When they lowered the man down to Jesus, he looked at the man and said, you saw their faith. He says, when he saw their faith, well, you better have faith if you're going to lower somebody, tear somebody's roof open and then lower somebody. <laughs> you better believe, believe, not just be out there on a whim. No, he saw their faith. And he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. And people got upset with him. Who has the power on earth to forgive sins? And so he said, just so you know that I have the power to forgive sins, he turned and he said to the man on the stretcher, get up. Yeah. And he healed him right there and then. See, if you're alone, Proverbs 18, one says, he that separates himself interferes with and wars against all sound wisdom. When you separate yourself, you make yourself a prey. But when you belong, there's safety. There's security. Thirdly, listen to this. The objective for groups is not just getting everybody in groups. It's belonging. <laughs> I'm going to say that again so we catch it. The objective for getting everybody in groups, getting you to be part of a group, is not to get you in a group. It's to belong. Fourthly, if you belong to something, you're a part of it. And so there is that making a difference factor. You make a difference with the people in the group, you make, with the group that you're belonging with, the church, the 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 community, and you make a different to get, difference together with them out into the world. I like one man said it this way, that is the secret gift that unfolds as you become integrated into something that is larger than yourself. You find yourself saying yes to possibilities that you would never otherwise imagine. Oh man, see it, let your lenses get clear. See something different. Listen, when, when, when you're a part of the church, and the addict gets sober or stays sober. Oh, glory to God. When you're a part of the church and and a little child at the other end of the building, we're not babysitting down there, by the way. I remember hearing about a full-grown man who was coming out of prison. His life was a mess, been miserable. And as he was thinking about his life, he remembered the one time in all his life he felt loved was when he went to Sunday school. The one person that he felt love from was that lady that was teaching him in Sunday school as a child. You know what? He went back to church. 
He went back to, we're not babysitting down there. We are putting things in, listen, there's a lot of things been put in your life before you can, you were even old enough to remember what was going on. The Psalm says that God taught us to trust from our mother's breast. There's eternal things happening right down there. Things larger. I'm telling you, when you get integrated into the whole, God will stretch you and, and bring you into capacities and capabilities larger than you ever dreamed of. Glory be to God. Number five, belonging is what moves, us, moves it from them to us, from your church to our church. Number six, family is great, but there's something you get from a church family that you can't get from your natural family. Can I get an amen? How many times have people told me that I'm closer to my church family than I am to my natural family because there's an intimacy there. Number seven is continuance. I found that people who don't engage don't make it. I know that's straight. But very few, if any, who just come or come now and then, kind of on the fringes, but don't engage. They don't stick. Long range. They don't bear fruit. They don't get to... Listen. Listen, guys. God has a great plan for your life. But unless you engage, you're never going to taste and see that the Lord is good. It's there. It's there for you. And that's why you need to engage. Number eight is the anointing. There is an anointing in this house. I mean, if you want to, if you want to have sin run your life, if you want darkness to dominate you, if you want the things of the world to be your life, then go hang out with the world because anointings are absorbed by association and fellowship. But if you want victory, if you want to more than conquer a life, if you want to overcome, if you want to move mountains, if you want to have things get out of your way when you come walking, or if you want the strength to deal with whatever comes in life and stay on top of it with joy and victory, praise God, be in this house. Amen. Number nine is there's a diversity There's a diversity, which is a a diverse unity, and it's beautiful. It's just like a university, one with many different things. And here's a question for you. The things that you are belonging to, your belongings in your life, are they pouring into your life, or are they taking things from your life? Because everybody's going to belong to something. And finally this. As I said earlier, some people just have an an issue or something in the way with belonging to the church. After all, there's imperfect people there. But how about letting that thing be a thing that's a problem to you become a joy to you? How about realizing that God is working through his church that he has chosen out of all the vessels that he could have used. He's chosen to pick us imperfect people to work through. Sure, people sin. Sure, leaders have lids. Well, pastor, why don't you preach like Stephen Furtick? Well, because I can't wear his clothes. You know? It just, you know, I... I got dresser degree. I got dresser disease. What's that? Well, my chest fell into my drawers. <laughs> well, whatever. No, I can't. I'm not him. I mean, at some point, can we praise God that He chose us? You know, we're not Elevation Church. We're not Church on the Move. We're not Rhema Bible Church. You know, we're not. We're us. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say it to him, this is us. This is us. (laughs) With all our faults, all our failures, all our stuff, this is us. 
This is us, chosen of God, to manifest to the principalities and powers in heavenly places the manifold wisdom and grace of God. Thank God. So how about rather than getting all upset about there's imperfect people there, how about saying, thank God, look what God is doing through imperfect people. Yeah, they sin, the leaders got lids. We're us. We'll always be us. Thank God he's chosen us and brought us together to accomplish his purpose in the world. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you for your word this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I have some steps for you to take. First of all, the very first step to belonging is to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. God so loved the world, he sent his only son, not to condemn the world, but to bring life to the world, to save the world. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Delivered, like we sang this morning, surrounded with songs of deliverance. Welcomed into the arms of the Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. With security and assurance to go forward with Him. If you would say, Pastor, I believe what you said about Jesus. And let me finish it. Three days after He died, He was raised from the dead by the power of God. And God made Him Lord. And He's returning And whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whoever gives their life over to him will become a child of God. Life comes. So you say, Pastor, I I believe what you're saying about, I believe that, but I don't know that I've ever done it, that I've ever received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Well, you can do that seated here right now. We're gonna pray in just a moment. And I'd, I'd love to have the privilege of leading you in a prayer and bringing you into the family of God so you can experience his goodness. So if that's you I'm talking to to you, uh, and you would say to me, Pastor, while we're praying as a congregation, I'm praying right here, I'm accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, I'd love to know that I'm praying with you. On the count of three, would you raise your hand so I can see it? One, two, three. Just lift your hand. Hallelujah. Church, let's pray together. Say it with me. Dear God in heaven, Thank you for sending your son Jesus to save me. Right now, I trust you, Jesus. Come into my life. Make it new. You're my Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Now, you say, well, I didn't see any hand go up. Well, how do you know? Were you peeking? You're supposed to have your head down, your eyes. <laughs> no, but you know what? There's been days when we didn't have any hands raised here. But people watching on Facebook Live accepted Jesus. Amen. You know, so we're just not here. That's right. You know, we're out there as well. Here's a second invitation. If you would say, you know, you've heard about membership, I'd like to, why don't you take your connection card out right now and just write on there, write on there in somewhere or check on that back of that connection card. Give me information about membership. I want to be a member of Word of Life. Get me some information about membership. Go ahead and put that on there. And then another step that you can take is this. We have coming up at the end of this month a a series of groups. We want everybody that's part of the church to go through that called the Life Track Groups. It's going to be six weeks. We're going to go through the series together. We really want all the church to go through that. So if you haven't yet signed up, write on there. Sign me up for Life Track Groups. Now, I'm going to be real bold right here. If you're a member of the church, you don't even need to pray about it. Well, let me pray about it, Pastor. Listen, if you're a member of the church and the leadership of the church says this is what we're doing, you don't even have to pray about it. You just get involved. Unless it's sinful. Thank you for that holy silence. But it's the truth. It's the truth. We're going through this together. We're experiencing this together. So sign me up for Life Track Groups. We really want you all in there. And then finally, here's the fourth thing, is that I want to be a part of the the ministry team around here. Give me some information about how I can get involved in the dream team. You can write dream team down there. We'll give you that information. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
I want to come back to something before I turn it over to Pastor Joy. I'm going to finish where I started. I grew up in a church where I knew I was loved. It was secure. I was a kid. I didn't know everything. You know, I came to Christ later on, but there was something about that belonging. And I want that for you. So that's why we talked today about why belong. It's not just membership. It, it, it's not just a group. Okay? It, it's, it's not just attendance. It's engaging. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Today, thank you for the way you minister to our hearts and lives and for helping this come home to every heart. Lord, you know whether each person is at individually and personally what needs to, to happen, what words need to be spoken, what work you need to do. Thank you for your great love bringing each of us forward and all of us together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hello and thank you for joining us this week. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, I'd like you to prayerfully consider partnering with us financially so we can get the Word of God to more and more people. We really do pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if you're in this area, next Sunday at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, come on out and join us. If you're not here in the area, then please join us again online next Sunday. Thank you again and God bless you.